Hi, friends. Welcome to the Connected Families podcast. I'm your host, Stacey Bellward. Our purpose in this podcast is to guide you to receive God's grace and truth and then to equip you to pass that grace and truth on to your children. I'm so glad that you are here today. Today's podcast, Jim Jackson, co-founder of Connected Families, interviewed Michelle Livingston about connecting with teenagers and keeping hope alive. Michelle has mentored hundreds of teens, particularly as she worked for Treehouse, a national agency working to bring hope to at-risk teens. Michelle grew up in a loving family, but often struggled feeling fully accepted by her peers. As the product of an interracial marriage, Michelle frequently felt misunderstood and discouraged Discouraged to embrace her identity as a biracial individual. Michelle speaks to youth parents, youth workers, school administrators, churches, community organizations, and business professionals. She's currently working at the Center for Transformation and Training as a biblical counselor and spiritual director, training and equipping organizations like Treehouse to apply the power of God's word to experience spiritual, emotional, mental, and relational healing in their lives and in the lives of others. In her downtime, you will find Michelle raising teenagers of her own, singing off beat with her husband and continuing to grow and enjoy each new season of life. And now listen in to Jim's conversation with Michelle Livingston. Michelle Livingston, it is so good to be with you on this platform today. You know, I think you and I have known of each other for a long time, but welcome to the Connected Families podcast. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. It's so wonderful to have you. I know that you and I share this history where each of us for a better part of a decade, a little more than a decade of our lives gave our passion, our our learning, our experience to this place called Treehouse. Mm -hmm. And you came the decade kind of after I was there and you've worked in that setting with high-risk teens and you say on your website, which we'll make sure gets mentioned in the in the show notes, michellelivingston.org, and Michelle has two L's, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you know we're gonna we're gonna refer to that in the show notes. But just for, just for a minute here, take us into your experience working with teenagers for the last fifteen or so years. Oh gosh, my experience. I, it, it's been in a life changing is probably the the best way I can describe it. I actually started volunteering at Treehouse during a really difficult time in my life. I was separated from my husband at the time, soon to be divorced. And I was miserable. I mean, I was, I was a stay at home mom and I was focused a lot on just my own emotions and feelings and how terrible my life was going. And I just kind of got sick of myself. You know, I kind of was like, you know what? Like I, I can't fix my situation. Let me, let me go try and fix somebody else. Right. Like that was my <laughs> immature, you know, you're not, you're mine. Yeah. Right? You're young and you're walk. Let me go see if I can, can, can help others. Cause clearly nothing's changing over here. You know, my parents taught me at a young age to who much is given much is required. And so I was like, let me, let me try and see what I can do to help my community. And so that's kind of where I found Treehouse. And it was so great because, you know, I'm thinking I'm going there, I'm going to, you know, help kids that are struggling with hopelessness. And I had all these grandiose plans and, and God was just up there like, oh, she's so cute down there. You know, like I'm at, he he was like, girl, I'm sending you there for you. You know, these kids are fine. I got these kids. You're the one that needs Treehouse. And he was right. I really, as a, as a, as an adult, I needed the community the love, the grace that that Treehouse provides. And what's so cool about working there is not only do you get to create that environment for the kids, but the kids create it for you as well. You know, we're giving to the kids and the kids are giving back so much to us. And and I walked in there. I remember for the first time I walked in there, I met a teen, had just gotten out of a group home and she shared a little bit with me about her story. And then after that, I went into support group and heard of another teen who had who had lost her mom at the age of 12 and her sister nine months later you know, what she was going through. And, and I mean, these kids are dealing with all this heaviness and, you know, I'm coming in there thinking I'm going to help these kids. And, and, and I just, I was aware of my own heaviness when I was there. And by the end of the night, the laughter, the love, the encouragement that I left with was exactly what I needed to find Mm. my hope back. You know, these kids helped me 
believe in myself again. They helped, they helped restore my joy. They helped restore my hope. And it was like, they motivated me to continue to go and push on in life after this traumatic experience was going on with my husband and I, they, they continued to show up. Right. And so they encouraged me to continue to show up in life as well. And so they were like that motivating factor for me to just put one foot in front of the other, keep coming to Treehouse, keep coming on Thursday nights, keep listening to the talks, keep, you know, just keep, keep, keep moving. Yeah. The Treehouse gave me my life back. You know, they, it really did. Those kids are will forever have impacted me and motivated me. And I mean, you know, you get there and these kids are going through way more than, I mean, this girl at the age of 12 has lost her mom and her sister, right? And I'm at the age of 34, finally going through something. And it's like, but these kids are not giving yeah. up. And so it was kind of like, if they can get through what they're going through at the ages of 13, 14, 15, surely myself as a grown woman at the age of 34 can get through this. And so, man, they became an inspiration. Yeah. I mean, I just, I have so much love for, for Treehouse and the kids there. So you got inspired. Yes. And you experienced some transformation. And what I'm hearing you say, Michelle, is you started to see life through a different lens because of the closeness with the hopelessness. And yet, strangely, in that community of hopelessness is is a connectedness that these young people start to depend on each other. There's a symbiosis there. And I mean, I was like you in the trenches for 12 years with teens and you become attached to them. But then it also like I know that this was more than just a support group for Michelle. I know you learned some things about the art of helping the the young people in your care. And I know both at Treehouse and even in your own life, going through what they had gone through with you as mom, to find hope, to, to keep hope alive, to fan the flicker of hopeful you know, flames into fires of hope for for their lives. And that's really what I want to hone in on with you a little bit today, because what I know about you is that even in this description you've just given, you stepped into the experience of these young people. You learned to think like them, to be with them, almost to be one of them. So often, you know, I've heard you speak even from afar as you've been on newscasts and, and on different promotional videos that you represent the voice of these young people so well, because you've gotten to know them, you've been inside their hearts and minds. And I really want to take some time today with you, if it seems right, to take this direction along the line of how do we keep hope alive in the lives of our youngsters growing up in these tumultuous times? And how do we do that by understanding what it's like to be them? Man, I guess you have to talk to them. You know, I think some of the the roles that where we screw up as parents, there's a couple of things that I think we do, you know, and, and, and I can get in the mind of a teenager easily, but I think that kind of where we make some mistakes is that, you know, at Treehouse, and I'm sure you've heard this while you were there, we talk about, you know, discipline without relationship equals rebellion, right? And as parents, we can be so busy parenting, right? Teaching kids right from wrong, shoulds and shouldn'ts, working, um, that we forget to build a relationship with our kids, you know, we, we forget to date our kids. Oh, this is a whole new term for me. Oh, I, I want you to talk about what you just said for a minute, because I know what it means. I've never heard it before. We yeah. need to date our, our kids. Yeah. Say more about that. I love that idea. Share a little bit about my experience. You know, when I, when we got divorced, I, like I said, I ended up getting divorced. My, my thought was like, man, I need to keep my family together. I need to let my kids know that this is still a stable, safe place for them. And how old were your kids? And my kids, how many were, were there? there was three. My stepson was like, I think at that time was probably around 15 or 16, but then my three children were six, four, and two, soon to be three. And so what I knew from, from, from working at tree houses, like, you know what I need, I need to make sure that I stay in relationship with my kids and that my kids stay in relationship with one another. And so to me, the, the natural thought was to, you know, think about dating my kids. You know, my sister had talked about, she's going on a date night in the past with her kids. And I never really took much time to think about that until I was in a situation where I was worried about the relationship that I could potentially have or not have with my kids as a result of the divorce. And so I decided like, you know what, I'm going to start to date my kids. And so we would, we had date night as a family. And so the Friday nights that I had my kids, we would, I'd let my kids take turns picking what we were going to do as a family, go out and do that. And then uh, once a week, my ex-husband and I would switch off taking one of our kids out on a date. And again, finding out what it is that they want to do and just going and experiencing that with them. And that was just some solid time for them to 
just have one-on-one -on -one time with us as parents. And so mm -hmm. it's amazing what your kids are like when you get them by themselves, right? When you isolate them, get them out of that birth order, you know, and just really get to focus and hone in on who they are as, as a person. Yeah, and yeah. it was just a beautiful experience, you know, and that really helped to build the relational equity that I was going to need as they kind of grew into these, you know, turbulent teenage years, right? But be because I have that equity with them, because they know that I care about them, they're going to be more prone to listen to my encouragement, my advice, to maybe hopefully make different choices when they're faced with, you know, peer pressure. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where sometimes we can, we can demonstrate to our kids that we care more about their behavior than we do about them. You know, the rules that we set up in our household become more important than love, right? Or they take precedent over our relationship. You know, mm -hmm. when we do that, we're aiming at the wrong target, right? When my kids know that they are secure in my love, secure in that relationship, that I care about them as people more than, you know, their behavior, then I'm, I'm more likely to have influence on them. So that was, that was really key for me was dating my kids and building that relationship the mm -hmm. same way I would build a relationship with a, a teen at Treehouse. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't yeah. dating my own household. I really like that. Honey, going on a play date with me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like I said, you got to start it when they're young because they want to go with you then, right? Yeah, By the time you're well, a teenager. And then you work into the habit. So sure. But then your kids started, I mean, that was a while back. And so your kids have gotten older now. And how old are your kids now? Now my son's 19. He's in college at Hamlin University. And my other son is 17. He's at Totino Grace High School. And then my daughter is 15. She's at a champ. In Park High School. And so they, you know, we now even, you know, their schedules have gotten a lot busier, but I still like go take them to lunch, right? Like I'll go yeah. pick them up on a Friday and we'll go grab lunch during school. And, and that's my one-on-one -on -one time with them. And then I'll, I'll, I'll bring them back or, you know, at the end of the night, I'll go down in the room, you know, hop on their bed and just check in with them. Or we still try to have dinner every Sunday. You know, we have either breakfast after church or, or, or dinner, you know, we, we try to make that time where we come together as a family to just check in and be like, you know, how, how's everybody doing? Has anyone lost their mind this week? And, and you'd be surprised at the, the things that come up. So you figured out how to make that a safe space, which is really, I want to go yes. back to this idea, you know, and I had this sort of same experience as a dad with teenagers in my home, having worked with other people's kids for a long time, like you learn, uh, and hopefully you apply the learning at home, you learn how kids think and you learn what they need in order to feel safe, yeah, uh, to feel respected, to feel cared about, to feel heard, to feel seen, you know, th th but this is an art, you know, as I work with parents, I'm sure as you have worked with parents, helping parents learn to think like their kids think, not for the mm. purpose of getting them to do what they want them to, or figuring out how to say the right thing in order to manipulate behavior, but for the purpose of truly understanding and empathizing with the humans in your care. Yeah. Um, it is, it doesn't come easy. It's hard. Yeah, it is. And so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, a nine or a 10 year old who, you know, you discover, or maybe a 12 year old, let's go 12 years old, a 12 year old, fifth, sixth grade, you've discovered this child doing something they ought not do. You've come into the room, the computer screen shuts down. There's that guilty look on their face. There's there's, you know, panic in their eyes. And our inclination as parents, when this happens to go, what are you doing? Yeah. If you're a 12 year old and I'm your parent and I just myself react and get surprised and furrow my brow and raise my voice a little bit and maybe even pause because I'm learning not to be so harsh with my kids, but I still am like, what's going on? Yeah. At a moment like that, what's what's happening inside a 12-year-old, a, a caught 12-year-old's mind? What do they want you, the parent, to know as it relates to helping them as 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 well as they could be helped? There's a couple of things I'll say about that. I'll never forget one of my teens told me, this was probably like five or six years ago. She told me, she said, you know, Michelle, those times when my mom is being stern with me, what I really need from her is to be patient and gentle with me. Because sometimes the way that I'm acting is my cry for help without any words. Mm. And that just like, man, did that stick with me, right? Because it's it's kind of like, you know, God's way of doing things is always the opposite of the world's way, right? So like our, our natural impetus is to just like, you know, yell or be like, what's going on here? But like, if we could actually reverse that, and come in with grace. And, you know, I remember one time my kid got in trouble at school and I wanted to immediately, you know, when they called me from school, I want to be like, you know, we're talking about this when you get home, you're getting grounded. 
but I had some great counseling up until that point. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to pick you up from school today. And, inst- and when he got in the car, instead of yelling or whatever, I was like, let's go to Dairy Queen. Right. And I took him to Dairy Queen, which he was not expecting. Right. He was expecting to go immediately to his room. And during that time, I, I was just kind of telling myself, you know what? Keep your poker face on. Right. Because the reality of it is, is that kids especially when they're getting in trouble, they want to tell us stuff. You know, I've had so many teenagers tell me that I want to tell my parents stuff, but I feel like my parents are going to freak out or they're going to be disgusted or disappointed or ashamed of me. And so they even said that they would do things like they would like drop hints on conversations that they'd want to have with their parents. And based on how you pick up on those hints, like the reaction that you have will determine if they share more. Right. And so it, it's so key to kind of keep that poker face kind of like you were saying, like notice in your body as a parent, like what's going on? Because for me, when I'm getting ready to blow, I can feel it from the depths of my belly coming up to my chest. And so it's so key to kind of imagine in your mind, pushing that pause button, right? Mm. Just pushing that pause button in your mind to just kind of stop the, the connection between your body and your mouth and, and just take a deep breath. Yeah. Right. And move to seeking to understand first as to why they're doing what they're doing. Right. There's. Always yeah. So you said a why. key thing uh, that I want, I want to pause on even, even more deeply because you, you talked about this idea of paying attention to your body, paying attention to your, you know, the blood flow in your face. I can't remember what all the things you said were, but it's like being very mindful about what's happening with you and at connected yeah. families. We teach this simple principle for helping parents discipline more effectively, which is pay attention to what's going on inside of me, the parent right now. And then you use this terminology that I like, which is so that you can keep on a poker face. Yeah. Like that's about protecting your kids from all of your anxiety and all of your stuff and all of your angst. And it's not to say that it's not valid and that it shouldn't be there, but I hear you saying, you know, get in touch with that and, and then put it aside and then bring a blankness or even a curiosity. Like, you know, when you got yeah. poker face on, why do you have poker face on if you're literally playing poker? It's, it's so that you can read the other players as best you can without cueing them off to any of the stuff that's happening with you. Yeah, exactly. So you're also a biblical counselor. So you invite parents and grownups of all kinds, I'm guessing, and maybe even teenagers to look inside and get a hold of what's going on inside them, but with a spiritual lens on it. So as a parent, what are the things you've learned about, you know, where, where the fruit of the spirit, where God's spirit becomes active and you become aware of God's work in you as you're putting on a poker face? What do you got to do to even know that God's present there? That's a tough question to answer. (laughs) You know, I think that that's a lot of interpersonal work that you've been doing before that situation even arises, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Doing your own heart work of getting before the Lord in solitude and silence and, and allowing him to search your heart, paying attention to some of the, you know, pain or emptiness that, that, that you may be experiencing in your own life and dealing with that with the Lord first before you know, you start to to look for the faults in your other mm-hmm. children. You know, I think that the challenge is, is that when we discipline our kids in the moment like that, that's for us, right? We're, we're, we're out in, acting out of anger, out of maybe embarrassment or shame. And so for us, it's, it's we want to lash out to get rid of those emotions, right? To take them out on our kids outwardly gives us a sense of relief, right? But that does nothing to train a child up in the way that he should go. Right. And and we want to be looking at discipline in those moments as as a way to teach and, yeah. and train our children. Right. And in allowing that the discipline to really help mold them into who God called them to be, not to like let it be a moment where we can get our own angst out because we're having all sorts of feelings or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, we got to, as parents be, be doing the work, you know, we want, we want our kids to, to work on this, that, and other thing. And we got to be patient because transformation takes time, right? Even in my own life, you know, I've been in counseling for 12 years and, you know, I'll have, I'll have a week where I'm like, have I learned nothing? You know, it's like, we have to <laughs> just, be patient with the process. Go, go right back to the old defaults. Don't <laughs> Seriously. We? I mean, it, it, they really call it the slow work of God. You know, yeah, God yeah. is not in a rush. And so we really need to be patient with our children and knowing that, you know, yeah. they're, they're going to make mistakes. And yeah. To, and to reduce what I just heard you say to kind of a new thought again, so often as parents, we work harder to take care of ourselves when we discipline our children than we do to take care of our children. 
Yeah, exactly. I think this is such an important idea. How do we take care of our children when it's time to discipline them, especially when they're in in these angsty years and there's so much going on in the world and it's so hard for them to have a positive view of their personal future, right? We've heard that language before. How do we help our kids with that? And so we're going to take a break here quick and let you all know about some opportunities here at Connected Families. But on the other side of that break, I really want to come back and and hone in on, you You sent me a list, Michelle, of some questions or some statements that you really think teens might make or preteens might make to their parents if they could, if they could have that adult logical voice. And we're going to go through that list and kind of talk through what is it that will help teens be hopeful because now their parents know more about how to care well for them. So we'll see you all on the other side of the break. Hi friends, Stacy here. I want to tell you about a free resource that you can get today called Helping Kids with Anger. Anger is an emotion that all of us have, both kids and parents. We've all experienced it. It looks different depending on the personality. Sometimes it's slow and simmering, and sometimes it's surprising and explosive. But no matter how it shows itself in your home, it can be hard to know how to manage. It can be especially hard when identities start to get formed around anger. Well, if this topic of anger hits home for you, we have an ebook that integrates both biblical truth and brain science. It's designed to help you equip your children to manage their anger and emotions rather than just stop the behavior. You'll also learn how to work on your own anger first so that you can respectfully and constructively help your children work through their own big emotions. Head to our show notes and follow the link to download our Helping Kids with Anger ebook and take steps towards peaceful parenting and connection today. I am delighted to be with Michelle Livingston, who has, in my mind, become somewhat of a legend of youth workers, has developed so much wisdom over time, and you're building a ministry now that shares that wisdom with others, which people can see at michellelivingston.org, and that's Michelle with two L's. There's a lot of different ways to spell Michelle. Regardless, Michelle, I'm just so glad to be with you in this space today. Me too. Thank you for having me. We're here today to talk about about hope, keeping hope alive in our young people in a really kind of dark, dismal time, what Ed Stetzer Mm -hmm. calls, I forget exactly what the language for it is, but you know, every 60 years or so, there's a cataclysmic cultural shift that's just really difficult to go through as as a society. He suggests that we're in one of those now. And I think the implications of that for raising children and teenagers are significant, especially when we want to point our kids to Jesus and keep hope alive. And Michelle, I know you've given your life's work to keeping hope alive and pointing young people, your own, as well as many others, to the hope that is found in Jesus and to do that in a way that keeps it vibrant and real. So that's where we're going to kind of focus our time and energy for the rest of our time here today. I asked you, like, how do you want to address this in an email? And you, you got back to me in that email and you said, you know, keeping hope alive at some level is relational. It's about, it's about understanding young people and knowing what's going on inside of them and hearing that voice that they speak with that doesn't have words, but knowing what it means. I mean, you Mm. you didn't say it exactly that way, but that's the idea. And you sent me a list of kind of five key things that you thought would be really helpful for parents to understand is most likely inside of what might appear to be their hopeless or struggling uh, preteen or early teenager. And I kind of want to take some time here now to just go through some of these statements that you sent me and talk them through and, and hear the stories and hear your wisdom about this. But I want to frame it just a little bit because mm-hmm. I know our audience and our audience is, is, you know, largely parents who are, who are a, they're, they're Christians. They're wanting to point their kids to Jesus. They're doing the best they know how they feel frustrated and stuck. A lot of the time, most of them have got particularly one child. That's quite a challenge, mm-hmm. um, maybe more than one, but all, you know, frequently if there's, if 25 to 30% of our young people are struggling an extraordinary struggle and you've got three or four kids in your care, then one of them is going to fit this description. 
And I know you've got some personal experience with that. Would you care to share just a little bit about that as sort of a frame for the rest of our time? How, how did you point all of your children to hope? Oh, gosh, you, you nailed it earlier about really just creating a safe place for the kids, right? If all of us, we attribute what God is like to what our authoritative figures are like growing up, your, your father in particular, your mother. And so, you know, if you think about how God deals with us and, and how God is with our child rearing us, you know, <laughs> my thought is always that God is always my safe space right? He is that place where I can be completely transparent and vulnerable. And I know that he is not going to judge me. He loves me no less. He's going to be there for me, encourage me. And so how can we take what God offers us and extend that to our own children? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and like we talked about earlier, number one, it's, it's making sure that we are allowing God, we're, we're putting ourselves in a place of receiving before the Lord, right? Tending to our own inner world and our own inner relationship with the Lord and allowing what he's giving us to be something that we are passing on to our children, because we can't, we can't give away something we ourselves don't have, right? So if you're a parent out there and you are too busy to sit at the foot of Jesus you know, God reminded me this morning that there's actually only one thing you need to do today, Michelle, and that's sit at my feet, mm. right? And so we really need to be receiving the love and care and safe space that Jesus offers us if we want to turn around and give that to our kids, right? And in doing that, you know, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's that lack of judgment, right? It's that listening, seeking understanding before we move into punishment or judgment, it is that uh, bringing our authentic selves to our kids. We're so concerned about trying to be good role models, right? Which, which that's good, right? But, <laughs> you know, our kids are oftentimes going to learn more from our failures than they will from our success, Yeah. right? So as much as we can be real and honest with our kids, we need to do that. You know, the world is not, I had a teen one time tell me, the world is not filtering itself for me, you know? So, so why are you? mom, mm. you know, why are you trying to filter things? Just well, kids can smell a fake from a mile away. Right. And obviously there's, there's timing. And as far as things that we share and, but as much as we can be authentic and real with our kids, it's, it's, it's really important uh, going back to that understanding and having empathy for our kids. I mean, we forget sometimes that, you know, we were just as young and dumb as they were. I still think about some of the stuff that I did when I was in seventh grade, six, you know, my kids went to Ohio and my sister-in-law spilled the beans on me on some things. They came home. They're like, mom, you know, and I was just like, I wasn't ready to share that. You're not supposed and, to know that yet. That's Right, exactly. I ruined my, uh, it ruined your testimony. <laughs> yes, yes. But remembering what you did when you were a kid, understanding that, you know, they're going through some hard times too. We may not be able to understand what it is that they're going through, but we can always relate to the emotions that they may yeah. be feeling. I'm reading this list of things that you said that you thought kids wish their parents knew. Yeah. And, and it's, I'm, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the, actually the fifth one on the list, but let's talk about this one for a minute. If I'm a youngster, there's that word. I'm, I'm an oldster. So I use that word. Youngster. Yeah. That was, that was a word used about me a lot when I was growing up. I don't think it's a very common word anymore, but you know, kids, teens, students, they want us to know some things. Yeah. And I think your conversations with teens over the years taught you that teens want their parents to just listen and yeah. not have all the answers. Yeah. And just knowing that mom or dad or both is here can make things better. Like you yeah. don't have to give me all the answers. Yeah. I mean, matter of fact, they don't want your answers because they're going to think they're outdated anyways. We don't know anything, right? <laughs> mm, you're right. So, and I think that that goes back to oftentimes where we, we want to try and fix something because we feel uneasy. We feel uncomfortable. We don't want to sit in that place, right? Sometimes there's just not a solution. And People don't want your advice. The kids don't want your advice. They just want to know that they are understood. They want to know that, that you see them, that you hear them, and that you're in it with them, that you're there to journey with them. You know, my daughter, I actually was, was asking her before I came, I was like, what is it that you wish that I knew, right? Or what is it something that you appreciate about our relationship? And she was just like, you know, mom, you respect me. You respect that I'm my own person with my own path. And whether you agree or not with my opinions or some of the decisions that I make, you're still respectful of them. I had a, a, a teen tell me one time, you know, my parents have done a really great job of giving me my paint and giving me my brushes. 
Now let me go make my own art, even if it starts off as ugly, mm. right? And so really just respecting our kids. There used to be a day and age where we just respected our elders, right? That was just kind of our culture. But teenagers nowadays, even if you're a parent or a teacher, or you have to earn their respect, yep. right? That, that just doesn't come automatically because you are an authoritative figure, right? Kids are rebelling against authoritative figures right now, you know, especially in our, our, yeah. our culture right now with the police and what have you, you have to earn the respect. And if, if you want them to give you respect, you have to give them that same luxury in, in who they are and how they're choosing to live yep. their life in this moment and understanding that, you know, God is a big God, right? We try to box them in all the time. We put so much pressure on ourselves to be responsible for how things turned out, right? I'll never forget my own mentor, my own counselor told me one time in our session when I was, you know, trying to be a really responsible parent, he looked at me and he said, Michelle, God has not called you to be responsible for how things have turned out. Whoa. Or how things will turn out. He's called you to be faithful. There it is. Right. And there's a big difference between the two. You know, they may look very similar in their behavior, but the attitude is very different mm-hmm. between being faithful versus being responsible. Yeah. So that, that's a huge piece is, is really in short, what you're saying is let me become my own person. Yes. Yeah. Another one that you said, and I've got this highlighted on my screen right now, the way I'm acting is a cry for help without words. And when yeah. you're stern with me, that doesn't help. What I really need you to be is patient and gentle with me. So yeah. It harkens me a little bit to, you know, the fruit of the spirit language. Like, can mm. we as parents hear our kids cry that we walk by the means of the spirit that is in us when they're not acting the way we'd like them to. Yeah. The way I'm acting is a cry for help without any words. Walk by yeah. the spirit as you address this with yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You know, what we say at CFTAT is our actions advertise what we be, believe to be true about ourselves, right? Our mm-hmm. actions advertise what we believe to be true about ourselves. And so if you see me over here acting out, right, there is a lie somewhere in my belief system that I believe about my value or my worth. And if we can take the time, if we can restrain from freaking out that we're being terrible parents and that's why our kids are acting and think about what, what's going on in my child's soul right now that is causing them to behave this way what is it that they're believing about themselves that we need to renew their mind to the truth about who they are that we need to, to sit down and have a discussion about one of the things that i constantly am saying to my children when they are not acting right right quote unquote is i tell them this isn't who you are right i remind them of their identity <laughs> of who they are and whose they are, which is so important, especially when our kids are acting out and trying to realign that thinking. Because if we can affect that thinking, if we can get that mindset in the right spot, then their behaviors are going to follow. Yeah. So there it is again. It's this, it's the safety, it's this respect, it's this empowerment so that, so that we can give the kids in our care, the space they need to express for themselves what's going on inside of them. I'm going to move on to another one here that I've got highlighted. And you've mentioned this already in a couple of different ways. I learn sometimes more from your failures than from your successes or your good example. So be real and honest with me. And that's that thing about the filter. Yeah. You know, I, I remember when my, when my boys were getting old enough and the whole pornography thing started to hit and, you know, Lynn and I had conversations like, I, I mean, I, as a youngster was exposed rampantly to pornography and was, was sort of led by the older boys in my neighborhood into some experiences that, that I carry with me to this day that were very difficult and, and hard. And, you know, how much of that do I tell my children mm-hmm. <laughs> or do I tell them any of it at all? And, you know, we decided, yeah, I, I, I want to be honest, you know, not, not like, here's the stack of magazines that I look through. Why don't you take a look or anything like that? Of course, they're long gone. But, you know, to be able to say to my, at the time, maybe 10 or 11 year old kids as they're getting some of their first exposures. And nowadays with smartphones in, in kids' hands, even earlier than that, you know, it pretty much is happening late single digits for all the kids. Like, how do we talk about that? So I want you to to talk just a little bit about how to talk with our kids about our failures, inappropriate versus inappropriate sorts of ways. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't know that there's an absolute answer about that, but let's wrestle yeah. with that for a minute. Yeah. I mean, I think number one, this is where we have to walk by the spirit, right? I think we so badly want there to be rules. And, you know, at this age is when you talk to them about this. And at this age is when you, you know, again, it goes back to your own personal walk and relationship with God, right? Being in his presence, recognizing his voice, recognizing the movements of the spirit when, when God is leading you to have some of those conversations is key. And so paying attention to those things. Um, and when God opens the door, being willing to step into that. I think oftentimes it helps if we've we've worked through our stuff, right? Before we talk through it with our kids, because obviously we're not as emotionally attached in that moment. It's hard sometimes to have conversations with kids about things that maybe we're still struggling with. You know, sometimes the kids need to hear it. I think we can so oftentimes, kids will put our, us on a pedestal as parents or as authoritative figures in their life. And where I've often really ask God to help keep me humble is like looking at my kids as, is this is a transference of information, right? They're learning from me as much as I'm learning from them. And our kids can put us on a pedestal when they think that we never make a mistake, right? And yeah. they feel like then we are not relatable. We're too, we're too high up here. We can't relate to what they're going through. We've never done anything wrong, you know, but when we can, when we can be humble, and have a conversation with our kids about, man, you know what? I struggled with that too when I was a kid and, and here's what happened to me, right? Yeah. Here's my story. And talk about what we learned from that. Then it opens up, the kids are like, oh, wow, I'm not alone, mm-hmm. right? My, my mom has been here. My dad has struggled with this too. I have companionship on this, this, this road. I have somebody to walk through this who knows what I'm going through, right? And it's going to create the environment for them to, to come talk to you about it again should they continue to struggle with whatever it is that they're they're dealing with. Such good stuff, Michelle. I get the feeling we could go on and on. I uh, have so enjoyed our conversation. I'm talking today with Michelle Livingston. You can visit Michelle at michellelivingston.org. That's Michelle with two L's. It'll talk to you about her biblical counseling ministry, her history around working with high-risk teens, some information even about her family and experience she's gained there. Michelle, what a what a treat, what a joy it's been. Is there any last sort of encouragement for the parents in the Connected Families audience you'd like to leave us with today? Oh, goodness. One thing I'm learning about is the power of presence. Sometimes we think, especially when our kids are teenagers, they don't want to spend time with us. So we can, you know, it's a good time for us to go and do our thing or whatever. Man, I tell you what, as as present as you can be physically present with your kids, there is a sense of safety, a sense of being seen that goes along with it, that it, that is huge. Even if you're not interacting with them, even if you're in separate rooms and they're on their phones or whatever, the fact that the kids know that you're there if and when they're ready to talk and those organic conversations can happen is, is so vital. Be present. Amen. Well, Michelle, thank you so much. God bless you in, in you. your work. And I hope our paths cross again sometime soon. Definitely, Jim. Thanks so much for having me. God bless. Thanks for tuning in today, friends. Go to our show notes to download Jim and Lynn's free anger ebook. And while you're there, please rate and review so others can find us more easily. And if this podcast has been helpful, consider sharing it with a friend. For more information, go to connectedfamilies.org. I will see you next time.